gives me a lot of pleasure to welcome and to introduce our poet tonight, B.T. Shaw. B.T. was born and raised in central Ohio, not far from her grandparents' homestead. She had a stint as a journalist, and she got, after that, her MFA from the University of Washington. And since 1998, she has edited the poetry column for the Oregonian. She teaches writing at Portland State and the University of Portland, as well as in Writers in the School program. Her writing has appeared in Tin House, Climbing, Field, Agni Online, The Burnside Review, and elsewhere, in her debut poetry collection, This Dirty Little Heart, Eastern Washington University Press, won the 2007 Blue Lynx Prize for Poetry. Those of you who saw the email invitation know that she is learning to play the mandolin and wishes she could sing like Gillian Welch. In, in getting to know BT and talk with her, I've found that she has a wonderful sense of humor. She recommends the Marionberry Pie at the Bar Bipartisan Cafe on Southeast Stark. She is afraid of staplers. And I also learned that she has been in and just back from a trip to Canyonlands. National Park, and I was very excited about that because Jane, my wife, and I were going to be in Canyonlands at Arches National Park in about five weeks. So, and, and she emailed me a picture of Canyonlands, which was just lovely. So, would you join me in welcoming our poet for tonight, B.T. Shaw? Thank you. called Me Too, and there's an epigraph. While most rock bands flirt with the allure of destruction and the charms of sin, U2 has kept its eye on that corniest of feelings, uplift. The New Yorker, April 6th. The bird flew into the jet. The truck crossed the center line. The dose was too high. Nothing more could be done. The copy machine was like that when I got here. I am a people person. My instincts are spot on. There was no warning. I didn't hear the siren. The toilet was like that when I got here. <laughs> the hammer drill was like that when I got here. I'm sorry, it will never happen again. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have left it there. <laughs> the signs didn't say not to pet it. Nobody told me I couldn't eat it. You never said that. I'm a good listener. I don't care what other people say. The marmoset was like that when I got here. <laughs> it's not my fault. You have my full attention. The cephalopod, it was like that. The tire iron and the tibia, like that when I got here. Listen, it will never happen again. I love you. <laughs> Everything is going to be all right. 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 <laughs> okay, so my knees are actually shaking. I'm going to do something very scary here, the scariest part, and I'm going to try out, with your permission, some really brand new work. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the past week, 10 days, uh, thinking about the um, July 2007 shooting of civilians in Iraq, including two journalists, two Reuters journalists. Did you all hear the report on NPR? And anybody go see the video from WikiLeaks? And this has hit me in a couple of different ways because I was a journalist at Camp Lejeune, and I was married to a Marine. So. Those were all my people, the journalists on the ground. I feel like I knew the men in the air. 
In December 2007, that same year, a woman named Maria Lauterbach, also a Marine, was murdered outside Camp Lejeune. It got a lot of media coverage because the national media was in Jacksonville that week to cover the case of a Marine who had been charged with shooting civilians in Afghanistan. And he's a man who um, was acquitted and is now running for state senate. Uh, and what at that time hit me after having lived on a Marine Corps base was that while the media attention for this case was unusual, what happened was not. When I was a journalist there, we covered um, murders of Marines and by Marines, often domestic um, murders, um, nearly monthly. It's a culture of violence. And yet, I feel we are all complicit in a world where someone has to be a soldier, where someone has to do that job. So I've begun a series of poems that were inspired by Maria's story. Um, and I'm going to try some of them out on you tonight. The, the very small poems that are um, in between the longer ones are language that are actually pulled from her, her autopsy. So autopsy, summary. The body of this US Marine was found in a shallow grave. She had been missing for approximately one month. The rambling rose can only go so far, strung out between prefab columns flaking white. Whatever domesticity this rose was meant to symbolize has long since taken flight while the rose remains grounded, a thin-limbed semaphore meaning flagged. One black spot bloom hangs slack like a lip split before the bell. This rose is sick, yet it lives, which is more than you can say. No one wants to think it ends this way. Motor cortex sputtered out against the hollow vinyl door of a grayed tract ranch, partially clad in cement fiber board, lawn threaded through with nimble will, forget me not, and spider wart. We all prefer the fairy tale, red rose in her lace cap, peacefully unfurled beside a bear asleep beside the hearth. There, beauty never fails to break a fall. But here, the rose is one stuck stick. And the grass, girl, the grass is all that now becomes you. Autopsy, neurologic. It is not possible to evaluate the brain. When you love a Marine, your hat is your cover and it sits on your knob or your grape, not your head. A bird is a plane, a hump, a slog, the rack, the bed. Your love, he's a devil dog. Fangs help him get fed, paws scratch an itch. And you, you sewing kit, you're the dogs. When you love a Marine, you love the forest in spite of the fire. Trust the tiger to care for the lamb. When you're with him, you must believe his heart's on his sleeve and his arms are his limbs and ignore the arms in the chest that he locks. He keeps close watch, a K-bar, and the peace wherever there's call. And you, you keep making coffee 
the morning he demos four ways he could kill with a lace and one paw. When you love a Marine, the door is a hatch. A dress coat's a blouse. A knob is a head. And a head's, well, the head's a shithouse. Autopsy, cardiovascular. The heart is barely recognizable. Because you didn't mail the check. Because the house is a mess. How many times do I have to tell you not to buy the cheap gas? This milk tastes like shit. You treat me like I'm five. Hey, they're my kids too. They're your kids. What more do you want me to do? You said you would call. You were supposed to call. I said, never call me on duty at home. Why aren't you home? When did you get home? What do you have on? Where have you been? Where'd you get that? I've never seen that. I saw you. A blind man could see you want to be with him, with her. You smell like a bar, gasoline, lilacs, sex. You look like a slut in that dress, like a doll. Because you know you tear me up inside. When you lie beside me, sometimes you look like the sky. So beautiful, I could job out an eye. Autopsy. External description. Length, 51 inches. Weight. 95 pounds, body condition, charred, hair, charred, eyes, charred and decomposed, teeth, natural. Press conference. Time of death? Behind the sheriff's desk, a wall clock ticks, affixed to a chunk of oak stained the shade of burnt bacon. Someone has taken time to mod podge it with a cheap print of Da Vinci's Last Supper, then shellacked the whole sucker. Twelve apostles perpetually caught in reaction shot. In the camera's whitewash, the sheriff purses his lips, shuffles pencils as though the question afflicts him. In the back of the room, pens click, the sound offering him reason to linger in the light. The time is now 5.59 and 55 seconds. 5.59, 56, 57. We are waiting, he begins, and the second hand Rising, rising, raises its only finger. Okay, shoo. <laughs> Thank you for letting me do that. Here's a uh, palate cleanser. <laughs> and um, it's in some ways, in some ways, it's along the same theme. And it's not by me, it's by Jim Hall. Um, and it's called Maybe That's Your Poem Too. All my poems, who knows, maybe everybody's poems, is due to the fact, due to the awful truth, that I am Spider Man. <laughs> I know, I know, all the dumb jokes, no flies on you, ha ha, and the ones about what do I do with all those extra wigs in bed, well, that's funny, yeah. But you twy being Spider-Man for a month or two. Go ahead. You get those crazy calls from the governor asking you to twap some boogaloo who's only trying to whip off color TV sets. Now, 
what do I care about TV sets? But I pull on the suit, the stinking suit with the sucker cups on the fingers and get my ropes and little bundle of equipment and then I go flying like crazy across the town from rooftop to rooftop till there he is some poor dumb color TV slob and I fall on him and we wrestle a little until I get him all whooped. It's a big deal. You think when you're Spider-Man there's going to be something big happen to you. Well, I tell you what, it don't happen that way. <laughs> Nothing happens. Governor calls, I go, bring him to police, governor calls again, like that, over and over. I think I try something different. I think I try something exciting like wasting cars. Something to make my heart beat at a different weight. But then you just can't quit being something like Spider-Man. You Spider-Man for life. Forever. I can't even boin my suit. It won't boin. It's flame resistant. <laughs> So maybe that's your problem too, who knows? Maybe that's the whole problem with everything. Nobody can boin their suits. They are flame resistant. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, now you have to help me out a little for a few minutes, uh, figure out what to read out of my book. So somebody shout out a noun. Oh, come on. What, table? Hunger. <laughs> Tuesday's dinner for five was noodles with noodles baked in ketchup. <laughs> Night before that, squirrel, dredged like chicken, stuck in the oven. Last of the wine sap jam, mold scraped from its wax cap. Little sister plays with salt stuffed tails, says mink stoles. At school, heads go down on the art room table. The sharp knife makes the pigeon stretch five ways. Red clay, clay birds, bird shot, morels, dogs on scent, wild ginseng, night gigging. We keep some things to ourselves, hold those names in our soft mouths. I talked to my sister yesterday and she'd just been looking for morels this past weekend. Another noun. God. God? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, uh, okay. Tangentially, like, Bible characters. I have to explain this poem, though, because um, it was an experiment that in my mind maybe worked better than it reads out loud. So here's the problem I set up for myself. I wanted to do an abecedarian, but that wasn't enough. I had to do a double, but that wasn't enough. I had to do a palindrome for the first word of each line as the last word in that line. So. Good God. <laughs> so here it goes. Please have patience. It's long. Eve and Eve. Pounder. This is my only other poem with this word in it, and it just starts it off. But anyway, you already heard this word once. I'm sorry. A slut. Then he slammed the door on her, apple-cheeked in Tulsa. <laughs> Bird with head cut off flapping spastically behind the pinched rib. Cain by then unable, experts correlating his behavior to maniac DNA. Abel Cained, 
House foreclosed, impala impounded, and arrows too whacked on smack to leave them anything but sore. Flesh abundant, yet still unfitting. Who'd imagined so much self? God. Her fingers worried the sofa's boucle tweed. Who'd get the dog? <laughs> Honey, the narrator said, he don't want no dog. Man's got a new yen. Oh, if I were 20 years younger and unstained, the sofa sobbed. If I <laughs> jibed instead of jabbed, the sterling chimed. If I danced like Debbie J, knobs out to hear, the credenza cried, to no reply. The bogus bonk laid out in daylight. She saw how blind she'd been. Suspect speed dial? Madame L, next best Western. Account skim to scum? Adam, not error. Eved believed, the hangovers, torn unders, lost button. One and one makes three, the narrator nattered. Add it up, take no parts from the whole. No sign too bright to ignore, no bag too big to strap, Q-tip, on your back. No transmission too dropped for that devil in pit Q, rot being the root. Shut your head, Eve said. She was plotting each factor. Sex, sloth, wrath, that whole buffet, saccharin, hummers, quick nitro fixes, ten, ten commandments, got it. But what to do at 11? Fingerlings and fishnet, urge to eat everything a la mode, all consuming, dialogue, diminishing, e.g., are you Vulcan? I heart rubber. <laughs> Infinite wisdom on the line, they dashed for almanac love. Was it the snake then or the snacks? Who knew? They came, they saw, X marked a spot, they concurred, they bought, dug in, fell out, shorts and a helix. You bobbed unthinking, the narrator thought. Sure someone would toss a girl a buoy. The plane, the plane, the dog persisted. Nanai I waxis, why axis, Eve, making fast for a slow gin fizz. Wow. <laughs> I don't think I've ever read that out loud before in a group. Thanks. How about one more noun? Bird. I'm sorry? Bird. Bird. Oh, bird. Oh, bird. The first one I thought it was kind of sad. Can it be a dead bird? The first time your daughter runs away from home, a friar sits in the kitchen, half butchered, <laughs> its legs akimbo. A glass of ice water sweats on the dining room table. Who left that there? What time is it? When did you quit smoking? A phone in the hand is worth nothing. You sit at the window. The sun sinks below your neighbor's roof. Someone else's kid kicks a rock up the street in the gathering dark, his legs carrying him home. You don't know him. You wish he were missing. <laughs> there are sentences you can start, but you can't say what she's wearing. Your daughter, that little stitch in your side. Seed pearl, loaded dye. You wonder how you might bargain with a god to whom you aren't speaking. Her friends and the friends of her friends, no one knows or no one is telling. And the argument this morning about the boy, oh boy, the boy, 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 boy. You held your ground. You thought you'd gotten through. But in tonight's light, you see you were more naked than you knew. You wanted to shake her, to hold her. You wanted, you want, and now the clock has the only hands in the house that know what to do. Moths flock to the porch light. A bowl of grapes waits in the refrigerator. 
and when it's no longer late dinner but pre-dawn, a shadow you recognize crosses the lawn, her feet raising a drift of fallen cherry blossoms that were, as it turned out this time, only mimicking winter. Okay. So Judith Arcanis in the audience tonight, as she was, she was pointed out earlier, she's reading next month. And she and I have been trying to get together for, I don't know what, like six months. And um, every time we set a date, we have to break it because I'm in some chaos of some sort. And so this week when I broke the date, um, she wrote and asked, do you think there's meaning in all of this? <laughs> and I said, um, meaning, isn't that like the big question? And she wrote back and said, hey, big questions are us toots. We don't fool around with La Poesia for nothing. <laughs> so this is for Judith. <laughs> It's called, After You Bury Your Father, You Hope He Will Visit Your Dreams. But instead, there's a final exam in biology. <laughs> a fluorescent bulb in the hall flickers, the lockers shimmer as though filmed by Jacques Cousteau, who invented the aqualung but couldn't waive the final exam. You don't recall registering for biology. Were there prerequisites? You were asleep, you were asleep, then you were awake and testing Newton's third law in a kiddie pool with your pal Zuzu, though you still are not clear on the biomechanics of locomotion. You lost touch with him after age two. Outside, traffic moves in stop motion. Your brother, who clearly is not your brother, tries to wrench you the Indian Ocean, but you turn him down, and now the night is quiet and the world is calm, and you see the exam has only one question. After death, what is our phylum? You know this one, except sadly, you also skipped Latin. <laughs> then the bell rings. Then you hold your father's face in mind as best you can. Then the wind scatters leaves across the yard. Genus Fortinella. The tumor is the size of a kumquat, shadowy dark spot on the MRI. You were maybe expecting something classifiably citrus, lime, or ruby red grapefruit. The surgeon's a genius, or so his nurse says. The genius circles the kumquat with light from a pen. The woman beside you squeezes your fingers. The tumor has fingers. The woman beside you is a peach. A peach is not citrus. The tumor is a kumquat lodged in the left frontal lobe, taking up space that used to belong to the name of the peach. The pair of you joined nearly 49 years. 49, that's seven times seven, seven squared. The genius is moving his mouth while you do the math. Seven is prime. It is safe. It is lucky. The genius's mouth is still working, but you can't parse what he's saying. You can't crack the nouns. Now he is smoothing his pointer over the image, soothing the kumquat. The gesture's not touching. You want him to stop to cut it out, but he is speaking. The genius is talking. He says, I can't cut it out. And when you glance at the light box, his face for a moment is a giant plum, blue, hovering, lit by sun, like tree fruit you plucked as a boy, hunkered high in the limbs, waiting for a target, an ambling dog, or stranger's car at which to chuck it, for the heck of it. Some luck is like that.
And now the surgeon is the surgeon again. And the peach, what's her name, reaches for your arm. Seven is nothing more than threes plus a one. And the tumor, size of a kumquat, is a mock orange. What it knows is squat. I'm going to wind up with a piece of prose. There are a couple of you who have heard this before, and I apologize for the repetition. Thanks for indulging me. In 2008, my dad was diagnosed with a gliomultiforma. If you know those words signify a brain tumor with more tentacles than Cthulhu, you either banked too much time with CNN during Ted Kennedy's final year, or you've known, maybe even loved, someone who received the same sentence. Most men my father's age are gone within 12 months of a glioma diagnosis. But for an astonishing year, my father remained relatively well. His major symptom was aphasia. He'd reach for the word computer and come up with Cadillac. Autumn leaves became those little birds. Talking with my dad was conversation a la Gertrude Stein. A rose is a rose is a rose, sure. Now let's go out back and mulch the spatulas. <laughs> Some nouns, though, remained stable. Juarez, for one. In the late 1950s, my dad was stationed with the US Army near White Sands, New Mexico. Apparently, time he spent carousing formed some powerful neural connections. In his story, Ciudad Juarez doesn't drift. Its meaning stays put. Another word that runs deep from my dad is deer, as in doe, a deer, as in deer season. Growing up in central Ohio, I wasn't the only kid in school who packed leftovers for lunch, but I was the only kid I knew whose leftovers regularly included squirrel. Also groundhog. Wild rabbit, raccoon, grouse, partridge, pigeon, catfish, possum, bullfrog, bass, small fish and game have provided food for my family clear back to my immigrant great-grandparents whose land my father and his brother still own but no longer farm. Deer, though, were latecomers to the family supper table. When my great-grandparents settled in Licking County, Ohio, white-tailed deer population was zero, thanks to overzealous 19th century hunters. Deer, now about 600,000 strong statewide, weren't a source of protein for my family until the mid-1980s, which may be why squirrel was my family's first answer to the question, what's for dinner? <laughs> when I was maybe 11, my father took me squirrel hunting, a not unusual occurrence, but not exactly commonplace either. I was a girl, and hunting was mostly for boys. The morning was cold, and I remember wondering if my toes were going to snap off. We'd been hungered by the same tall oak since dawn. My dad had shot maybe a supper's worth of squirrel if served with enough limas and noodles. I didn't carry a gun, but I did cart the carcasses in a hunting vest so big on me it looked like a dress. For at least a half hour, we'd been listening to a pack of loosed hounds, a practice my family frowned on, chasing something on the ridge. Raccoons, I thought, until there was a crash in the brush and a large doe, nostrils flared, barreled down on us. She ran so close, I saw the panic in her eyes, which were a soft, dark brown like my little sister's. Dad raised his twenty-two and sighted her in, following her with the barrel of the gun, and I, I screamed, Daddy, don't shoot. A moment before, I'd thought nothing of carrying our dead dinner in a pocket. Heck, I'd been looking forward to flying their tails from the handlebars of my bike. <laughs> but a deer? The doe vanished into underbrush. A heartbeat later, two howling dogs followed. Dad lowered the rifle. Brenny, 
he said, failing to disguise his impatience in the face of such crave ignorance. It's not deer season. In Ohio, deer season is subdivided into sections, each with its own rules and restrictions. The first week in October falls early in bow season, and deer may be taken legally only by archers. This year, the first week in October also was when dad's left foot and motor cortex, like grandma and great aunt Gertrude before them, simply stopped speaking to one another. The foot refused to flex and had to be dragged back to its starting position with each step. But dad was determined. I was visiting, and even though I hadn't hunted with him since high school, I had told him I'd go with him, and daggum, we were going. So Monday night, I set the alarm for 4.15 a.m., and when it went off, I pulled on long johns, wool socks, jeans, gloves, a hat, and a jacket were stashed in a pack with a bag of gummy bears and a book. I foresaw a day of waiting. Downstairs, Dad was armed with a hiking staff he'd three days earlier insisted he didn't need, and two travel mugs filled with milky coffee. Forty minutes later, I unlocked the gate to the family land in near dark, and a few minutes after that, I had loaded the gear, camp seats, packs, the crossbow, a foam rubber quiver of razor-tipped arrows into the deer stand, a five-by-five five platform about ten feet off the ground. It was time for my dad to ascend the rickety ladder and maneuver his barrel-chested body into place. I am a lapsed Catholic. My last true experience with the church involved announcing to a Bible study group that the gift of skepticism was as valuable as the gift of faith. But on that October Tuesday, I came close to praying when it seemed Dad couldn't lift his recalcitrant left foot high enough to reach the first rung. I offered to lift it for him. He shooed me off. I paced. After a good 10 minutes of silent concentration, he got it, then the second rung, and the third. Slowly, he rose, then even more slowly, painfully, he moved one knee and the other over to the platform, clearing the ladder, and eventually scooting all the way into the stand. I alternately watched and couldn't watch. When he finally stood up in the blind, he called down, well, tell your mother and your sister they can bring food up here. I'm never coming down. <laughs> By now, the sun was pink behind the trees. I shimmied up the ladder. Dad whispered, if we spot a deer, don't move. I said, OK. And we settled into the dawn. Over the ridge, a woodpecker began breakfast. There was no wind and a bevy of tiny birds appeared, chattering as they ran up and down nearby trunks. I leaned forward to ask if Dad recognized those funny little birds, when there she was, a doe, delicate but definitely grown, strolling down the west side of the ridge toward us. Still half leaning, I whispered, Dad, a deer. Don't move he said again, and as though on cue, the doe stepped lightly into a small clearing, turned, and posed. Dad fired the bow. I did not scream. And the doe, well, she was hit, but she ran anyway, about a quarter of the way up the ridge. There was a great rustling of tall weeds near an old pile of stones, followed by silence. Immediately, Dad fretted. The arrow had looked funny, as though it were sticking straight up from the deer's spine. The last thing he wanted was to wound an animal, to create suffering. The next to last thing he wanted was for me to have to track said wounded animal over miles of woodland, and he decided we ought to wait a few minutes. If she had died, she had died near the stones. If she was wounded, but not dead, he didn't want to spook her into running. We sat in the stand discussing possible scenarios. Maybe I'd bumped the scope. Maybe he had aimed high. Finally, he sent me down to find her. And I did find her, just where we'd last seen the rustling. 
She was small, only a little larger than I, and gorgeous, her flecked winter coat just coming in. The shot was clean. She appeared to have died immediately upon falling. For a second time that day, I did something like pray. I touched her flank and thanked her for giving my father an experience beyond sustenance. With less effort than it had taken him to climb up, my father descended the ladder. We tied a rope to the doe's hind legs and I dragged her from the tall weeds into a patch of sweet grass where we tagged and field dressed her still warm body, leaving the organs for the buzzards and coyotes. We drove into Wilkins Corner to register her, and after Dad told the whole story several times, how it had taken us longer to load the stand than to bag the deer, we headed home, where we spent the rest of the day and much of the next two skinning, quartering, and butchering, preparing the meat for a winter's worth of meals. The following Saturday, I returned to Oregon, where I have never hunted. A week later, my father could no longer walk unassisted, an MRI revealed a second aggressive mass at the base of his skull. Early in his illness, just after surgery to resection the primary tumor, Dad couldn't consistently retrieve my name from visit to visit, so I took to wearing a, hi, my name is, sticker on my coat, a joke that never grew stale for him. I know who you are to me and that I love you, he would say, laughing. I just can't hold on to what to call you. Holding on, that's what we do, isn't it? Season to season, meals, rituals, places. We receive them and pass them on, hoping beyond hope that our memory holds its place in the chain. That day on the land, after we'd gutted the deer, Dad turned to me. He turned to me and he said, well, that was maybe my last deer. I was bent over knives that needed to be cleaned, and they bent a little further, trying to hide how close I was to crying. A ploy that worked too well, because he picked up the camera and snapped a photo of me in the moment, which I appreciate having, but I don't really need. There was a deer. I was with my father. I'll hold on to that as long as I can. Thanks. Tom, am I supposed to answer questions? Well, if there are, are there questions? I'm going to put on my other glasses so I can yeah. see you all. <laughs> So I've got one, mine has got one. Okay. Um, what does BT stand for? Okay, so this is the story of BT. It stands for Branda, Branny, and Thornton, like Thornton Wilder, um, which was my original maiden name. Um, but there was another Brenda Shaw in, in Oregon when I started to edit the column at the Oregonian. And she lived in Eugene, and she was a poet. And we would get each other's mail. It was sort of crazy. And we developed a, a phone relationship, and at a certain point I said, you know what, I'm just going to go to my initials so that people don't get us mixed up any longer. And that's where BT came from. This is going to be a hard, hard question to answer. But you, as editor, you see and read a lot of poems. You probably get lots and lots of submissions. I do. Years and also a personal reader of poetry, and you have been studying your masters and this and that, so you, you, you've read a lot more than I've ever read. Are there standards in poetry the way there are standards, let's say, in architecture or science or other arts about what constitutes? I mean, there are no standards, and anything would go. That's right. So how? What kind of standards do you have in poetry to decide, all right, that's publishable, or that's a good poem, maybe that's not so good? Is that a, I mean, is that a fair question? Oh, definitely, and I can okay. definitely tell you, you know, within the context of the Oregonian, what those standards are. Okay. So the, the, my mandate from the paper is that poems be of family content, 
which I've tried to dodge at times. <laughs> and sometimes I've gotten my rope yanked back, but sometimes I'm able to get something through that's more adult content, um, adult themed, let's say. Right. Um, and their second standard is that it not be longer than 20 lines. Actually, they only have space most often for something that's the size of a sonnet. So I'm looking for fairly small pieces these days. It used About three years ago, it was longer. It was 30 lines. But newspapers, you all know their story. It's a sad one right now. There's not a lot of space. Yeah. So they cut it down to 20 lines. Okay, so that's their standard. Okay. But here's my standard. So I generally don't... And I generally don't accept anything that's um, topical because that's the realm of the rest of the paper. Every now and then I'll take an, a, a poem that's um, a, from a current event, inspired by a current event, but most often not. I don't, I don't accept anything that's overly personal because then it's kind of hermetically sealed from uh, the general readership. And when you publish in the Oregonian, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who potentially see your poem on a given Sunday. It's a large readership with, you know, many attitudes about mm -hmm. poetry. Okay, so there's those two standards. And then it comes down to craft and delight. Right. I, I, I'm someone who um, wishes to see a poem that somehow is engaging in the larger conversation of poetry that shows some knowledge of, of what's come before and what's happening currently um, and that has moments of wonderment in it. It can be language, play with language. It can be um, more uh, epiphanic, I guess. Um, it, it takes many forms, but there has to be a level of craft involved. It can't just be here I am looking at the world or this happened to me. Mm -hmm. I think those are, those are perfectly legitimate ways to write. But for me as an editor, that's not going to meet my standard for the paper. Would you emphasize a bit on what you mean when you say that some reference to the past, the poetry, or if you're talking about literary just, devices? Or? Okay, well, here, I, I actually get letters cover letters that start this way. I don't read poetry, but I wrote this. <laughs> and you're out immediately. Like, I haven't even read the first line of your, well, and I do read the, I do wind up reading them, but I have never, I have yet to see a poem that sprang like Venus from the head of the poet, you know, without having a sense of, without having paid some dues to the muse. Yeah, right. Right? Well said. So, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I just wanted to say thank you for being an advocate and a, and a champion for poetry. Keeping it in the Oregonian, I know, probably takes a lot of uh, fighting sometimes to keep that space. But moving on, I just really enjoyed this. Uh, I wanted to ask you what's the next project? I mean, you've obviously read from some prose. Well, I, th I think right now I'm so consumed by the North Carolina poems that I probably will keep digging there. Um, but I have some essays also in mind. I'd like to do some more exploring on that front as well. Thank you for what you say. And um, I am not the only champion for poetry at the Oregonian. The books editor, Jeff Baker, and the copy editor, Peggy McMullen, they have gone to bat for that column over and over and over again. And then, of course, we've got David Bicefield, who writes his monthly column. So I'm part of a team. Um, how much do your books cost? Um, it's the... The, I didn't know whether the Friends of the Library were selling them or yeah. whether I was. If the Friends of the Library are selling them and a percentage goes to them, then it'll be whatever they determine. <laughs> <laughs> whatever the price list. Yeah, and if no, if it's, I think it's fourteen ninety five. If nobody has ninety five cents, if they've just got fourteen, it's fine. I'll take the cut. The percentage can still go to the Friends of the Library. 
What's your writing practice? When do you write? Do you have a little bit of time? Um, I no. <laughs> I write whenever I can. Like, I'm, okay, I don't recommend this, but I've written poems on my thigh as I'm driving. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the life is so busy. If it, and and um, I'm not a believer actually in inspiration. Um, I think you have to keep writing and finding ways to write. You're lucky when that lightning bolt hits, but it's better to walk through the world with open eyes and open ears, and like like you're a net and you're, you're gathering. Um, so I'm haphazard, but right, but I feel like I'm constantly writing. My, my handwriting is all over all the paper in our house. Sounds <laughs> <laughs> like you need to get a digital recorder. <laughs> um, the, the, does the newspaper ever publish people that haven't been previously published or have books before? Definitely. That's some of those are my like, I'm so excited when there was a um, woman who is a dairy farmer in Tillamook a few years ago, and she sent me, she worked at it. It took her probably six submissions before the right one came across my desk. And it's so exciting when that happens, when I get to be somebody's first editor. I think that's a thrill. Does the paper publish poetry every week? No, they used to. Um, again, space considerations. So it's down to between two and three Sundays a month. Okay, what section is it in? Books. And you have to hunt for it. Yeah, they, they don't, they don't yeah. like outline it in black and put arrows. Poem. It's, sometimes it's, it's hit, sometimes it's pretty hidden. Um, but it's there. I have a more question. Um, will you go with it or will it um, take poetry from teens to put it the paper? I have, but I have the same standards for teens that I have for everybody else. So it's not, it, it's sometimes rare. Often people who are in their teens are just beginning their poetry, and so it's, they're still practicing the craft. But it has happened, so, and I always write back. And if any of you have, have written to me and I haven't written back, my email sometimes swallows things before I can get to them, and I apologize. <laughs> But I, I do, I try very hard to make sure that people receive a response. Sometimes it takes me, one, recently it took me 18 months. Um, because the poem was in my slush pile, and I kept thinking I could find a place for it, and then eventually I had to give up. But I wrote back. Do, do you prefer submittals through the mail or by email? Oh, that, that's a really good question. I actually prefer them by mail because I like seeing them on the page. And here's the really big one. Email is so instant that if I send a polite rejection, somebody fires something back within 10 minutes. And it, it, so my, my inbox is never empty. I never have that sense of, oh, I'm done. And there's not time. It doesn't feel like time for a relationship to develop. Another, another woman for whom I was the first editor, she wrote to me over a period of three years. And we had, we had a relationship. And so then when I finally, when she finally sent one that was an exact match for the Oregonian, it was such a celebration. And I've heard from her since. Email doesn't, I don't get those relationships so much with email. Thank you, Tom. I want to thank you very much for being here. Thank you for There's having me. Here. Please stay and socialize. Let's give a